I'm Doug from 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast, and welcome to another edition of The Chicken Head Chronicles. This week I'm going to be reviewing a brand new VIC-20 game that was written by Gislan Debois and published by Double Sided Games. Now, as the name implies, this is not the first in the series of Realms of Quest. Realms of Quest 1 through 4 was published by Cytronic, and uh, Gislein made those years ago. And as a matter of fact, Cytronic is just about to release a quadrilogy, which I guess is a word, of the first four games. It should be available on their website soon, and I'll, I'll put the link down here and also in the description. Now, Realms of Quest V is inspired by several different games. You're going to see a lot of inspiration from Ultima in here. You're also going to see a lot of inspiration from games like The Bard's Tale and, and the role-playing game Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, which we've all heard of. I played it for years when I was a, a youngin. Very, very strong influences. Um, You'll see that firsthand in a moment when we get into the game. Now, Gislan was not alone in the creation of this game. Uh, he's been working on it for years. Uh, he did most of the programming. The dungeons were created by Ruby Gollum, which is by far the coolest name of anybody on planet Earth. Ruby Gollum. Uh, Brian Henry did the physical artwork, which is just incredible. Here's a, a sample. I'm going to make an assumption that Brian did this. This is uh, the front page of the manual that I printed off. Michael Kirshner was the technical advisor. Ryan Liston did the music, which is great. And Jeremy Marson of Double Sided Games was the producer. The game itself runs on actual VIC-20 hardware as long as you have 32K RAM expansion. Now, personally, I recommend the Penultimate Plus cartridge from my friends at The Future Was 8-Bit. I'll put their link down here, too. Not only does it add up to 35K RAM expansion, but it has a ton of other features, or as Rob from The Future Was 8-Bit would say, a million. If you've got the physical version, the game comes on several five and a quarter inch floppy drives that work just great in a real 1540 or 1541 drive. Now, it also supports multiple drives. So if you've got drive eight and drive nine, you can have the multiple disks in, in each drive and it reads them automatically, which is kind of an uncommon feature for Commodore 8-bit. Now, the downloaded version will run on just about anything. So if you've got an SD to IEC or a Pi 1541 or kind of storage device, it runs great on there. It will The downloaded version will come on a D64 file and a D81 file, which emulates the 1581 drive. That is the ideal way to use it on one of these devices, as then there's no disk swapping at all involved. It just runs right off of that. This brings me to the next point, which is the rig that I'm running it on. Let me show you. Here's my lovely little VIC-20 here. Now this is one of the original models that has the two-pin AC adapter and then all of the electrical conversion equipment inside runs like a champ and is actually quite beautiful, quite slick and slight and quite white too. Now, this, I've got the game itself converted over directly to a 1581 uh, disc. So I have put the entire game right on floppy here. This is one of my old Amiga discs I used. And it's just amazing. You know, one of these discs holds 160 times the amount of data as this little guy has RAM. Just incredible. Now I've got the penultimate plus cartridge plugged right in there. If you don't own one of these, get one of these for your VIC-20. They are just absolutely incredible. They add so many features, so many games, so many programs. But this will get us up to a whopping 32 kilobytes of memory. And of course, the VIC-20, because of how it reads everything, will only show 28159 bytes free for basic, but it's plenty to get us going. So let's get into the game. Now, the physical version of the game, if you are lucky enough to pre-order it, 
is going to come on several five and a quarter inch floppies. It's going to have a fold out map of the land of Rivera that the, the game takes place in. A, f a full manual and a cool little gold coin. And you see I've put up some pictures of the kinds of things that it's going to come with. Now, unfortunately, all of the pre-orders of the physical game were sold out a week or two ago. The downloaded version will absolutely be available on July 1st, and they'll be shipping out all the pre-orders of the game. But I've heard rumors on the grapevine that they're going to be doing a second printing of it this summer. I really encourage them to do that. I think they'll sell through the next batch of them too. Um, print up a million, see how they sell. When my pre-order comes in in a week or so, I'll do an unboxing video of it to make you all insanely jealous. Now, the game itself here plays fine with either the keyboard or the joystick. So see, I can use my cursor keys and shift up and down to go here, and then shift right and left to look at my other options. Or I can use my fancy Genesis joystick and do the same thing. Now, personally, Moving around with the cursor keys has become second nature to me since I was 11 or 12 years old and I first got my VIC-20. So I play with a keyboard and it works absolutely perfect, but your mileage may vary. Virtually everything in the game is menu dri driven. See here we have create party, delete member, equip, go to the inn, go to the market. All of these are just cursor up and down and hit enter to do your various things. And it's a bit overwhelming in the first couple of minutes figuring out what everything is, but look through the manual and, and read through it and try it out and pretty soon it's just absolutely second nature the way that it's laid out. Now, this leads me to my next point. This is no easy game at all. It's very deep, very involved, and requires a lot of planning and foresight to get the best experience out of it. As I mentioned, it is influenced by Dungeons and Dragons rules, so there are a lot of behind-the-scenes dice rolling, saving throws, and chance encounters. You have to plan out your party of 10 adventures very carefully in order to make the most of this game. Also, expect to die a lot. I lost my entire party several times while getting used to the games, and even after that you'll have a favorite character get iced now and again. Luckily there is a resurrection system, and the save system is quite nice. I find myself saving after every encounter and before entering any new area, just in case. Let's take a look at the game itself, from initial character creation and then on to actual gameplay. Next we can go to create a party. Now here is where we're going to actually create our characters. Uh, what you're going to want to do is using the cursor keys and the enter key, choose the create option there, and then you're going to choose which slot to create your character in. I chose slot one, there's a dwarf, and you're going to see you get to choose the alignment and you're going to be able to choose what kind of character they are. Now, if you don't like the rolls you get, you just hit that little re-roll button on the bottom and it, it'll re-roll the dice. Each character class or each character race has a little bit different attributes uh, and some have bonuses and certain attributes. Now, what we're gonna do is just go ahead and zip through and create a bunch more characters. I've got this sped up about eight times here and I am specifically looking to create certain types of characters, rangers, paladins, wizards. So I'm going through and uh, re-rolling some dice there to get the optimal characters. Now, you'll notice as you go through the video here that these aren't necessarily the characters that I end up with because some of them died and I had to uh, delete them and re-roll certain characters, which is kind of nice. This is one of them who happened to die, my little sprite there. Now, alignment, if you notice, I'm choosing alignments for each of them. That relates to how people interact with you, and it also relates to your ability to run away from combat. Uh, what is it? Chaotic characters tend to stay and fight. Lawful characters have more of a chance of being able to escape a fight. Kind of interesting the way that they do things. You can choose male or female characters, and each one has their own unique uh, view so a male dwarf and a female dwarf look a little bit different. It's kind of fun There we've completed our party of ten characters and Next critically important 
is going to the market and buying equipment for them because your characters start buck naked. So you start out with a thousand gold. You can go down and look at each type of weapon or each type of armor, see what kind of damage it does, see what kind of defense it gives you, and then buy them. You see, I'm zipping through here, uh, buying equipment for all my characters. Definitely get some type of armor for your fighters and give everybody at least some kind of weapon at the beginning. Here we're at the inventory screen for Dwayne the Dwarf and we're equipping a short sword for him and leather armor for him. And we'll go through each of the other characters. We go to equip, choose our character, and give them some weapons and armor. This is something that's easy to miss and you may just zip on by after you create your characters and head out the door and they're gonna go out there buck naked. So you have to equip your characters. And certain characters can only use certain kinds of weapons. Fighters, of course, can use just about anything. Wizards are limited to robes. Rangers are limited to very light armor. Now we choose the move option and you see where the looks of Ultima come in here. That's your little uh, party right in the center, the little green guy. You see the nice flowing water. But before we do anything, save your characters because they will die the first couple of combats and you wanna be able to go back and uh, start over again. So save your characters. Now this is kind of fun. We're walking up a path right here. We could go any place in the world here. Some of the areas will damage you. There's lava areas, there's poison areas, but going along the paths tends to be rather safe. And in a second here, we're gonna meet up with our first batch of enemies, a group of orcs. They ambush us and they start damaging our party. Now, auto hit will allow you to just go through. Everybody chooses to fight and you just attack the characters normally. I like to do it one character at a time. So Dwayne, of course, being a fighter is gonna attack. Gorn is uh, my ogre. He's also going to just attack them and uh, very handily kill the characters. Now, characters like your paladin or your war mage, uh, like I have coming up next, they're going to attack now, but later on, as they increase in levels, they're going to be able to do things like cast spells, which is kind of nice. Now, here, Lord Ramsey is going to be casting a magic missile. See how I chose cast, chose a spell, boom, killed the orc. And uh, Shmo my, is my cleric. He's gonna cast a spell too. He's gonna cure some wounds. If you look to the left side of the characters, when they have a little uh, plus sign uh, with like a little medical kit next to them, it means they're damaged. And so he's going to uh, cure the wizard there. He's gonna cast a spell. Nope, that's the wizard casting a spell. Ha <laughs> ha, killed another orc. Now occasionally, not always, but occasionally you'll find treasure chests when you defeat a group of enemies. You don't always get gold when you kill enemies. You'll always get experience. You won't always get a gold. In that case, we got some gold. Now, here our party has entered a town and we're gonna start talking to some people. We'll go up to this little girl here and you can do things like get their names, find out what their job is, get information on them, give them a coin or two, the pay option is if they have something for sale, you can buy it off of them. Like uh, in this case here, this dude has a bottle of magical wine. Uh, he's going to tell me about his winery and the fact that he can sell us a bottle of wine for 60 gold that has healing properties. So I'm going to go and I'm going to choose pay. You buy yourself a bottle of wine. It's a little bit different than shopping at the market. You don't go into a separate screen and choose what you're going to buy. You just talk to them and tell them to pay. Now we'll go up and talk to a guard. I used to be an adventurer like you. Then I took an arrow in the knee. Okay, looks like I left my Skyrim DVD in my 1541 drive. Sorry about that. Here, you can actually talk to the guards and sometimes get information from them. When you actually get back to one of the three castles that has a market, that has an inn, you're gonna be doing a lot of selling of equipment, upgrading equipment with the gold you find, and making your characters more and more powerful. You'll also spend time at the inn Whenever you see a regular plus sign to the left of your character, that means they've gained a level or sometimes even two levels at a time. 
each character class gains levels at a different speed. So for example, a kobold will level up much faster than an elf, and a peasant will upgrade and level up much faster than, say, a wizard. So depending on what classes you are, you're going to level up differently. So you're going to spend a lot of time on the character screens going back and forth and upgrading your character. I think you can see a lot of the Ultima influence in there and also a lot of the Bard's Tale influence in there, especially when it comes to meeting up with enemies and fighting large groups of enemies. This really just scratched the surface of the game. I've put about four hours into the game so far, maybe five hours, and I feel like I have barely scratched the surface. I've found maybe nine of the shards of Uthar. I've found only one of the other castles. I've gone on a lot of little adventures, but I haven't even made it into any of the dungeons yet, which are nice 3D view dungeons on there. And I think part of that is I'm afraid my characters are going to get slaughtered when they first go into a dungeon. So I'm spending my time building them up, leveling them up, getting them new equipment to, so they can handle some of the higher end enemies in the game. There's a very strong story in the game. It's all about uh, Lady Bane has brought the entire land of Rivaria together uh, for good or for ill. And now there's a, a rebellious group that's trying to uh, well, rebel and break the whole union apart. So she wants you to go out and find these 120 shards of Uthar to create this tablet of Uthar that will consolidate her power. And you have to go around exploring cities, talking to people, uh, the hundreds of people that, that appears to be in the game, talking to them, finding the shards, going on quests for them. The pieces are literally scattered all over the place. Sometimes commoners have them and they'll just give them to you freely. Sometimes a member of royalty has them and they'll charge you 10,000 gold for them. Other times you have to go on quests for people to find them. And then other times you just find them lying in a forest someplace. You just, you know, get clues from somebody, you know, whoa, I've seen a shard of Uthar uh, three miles north of such and such. You go three miles north, there's a shard of Uthar once you search. It's kind of cool. I, honest to goodness, would never have imagined that our little VIC-20 here with its native 5 kilobytes of RAM could handle a game this big and this in-depth that literally could take you hundreds of hours to finish. So what did I think about the technical aspects of the game itself? You can already tell I love the thing. The graphics are absolutely stupendous. Each monster each race has its own portrait, its own graphic, and all of them are done in pretty much the highest resolution imagery that the VIC-20 can muster. And they are just incredible. If Gislan had just put together a demo of all of the portraits of the monsters and characters that he created and released that, we would all still be going, wow, that's really awesome. But he did that and he built an entire 200 hour game around it. The graphics are incredible and I would say it's one of the best looking VIC-20 games that I've ever seen. The audio is fantastic too. Uh, they did a great job on it. Now occasionally you might think that the music gets a little bit repetitive but you can just turn it off. There's an option right in the options menu to turn the music off but overall it handles the sound just fine. Sound effects are great. Music is great. If I were to find any criticisms at all in this game is it's sometimes almost a little bit too deep. When you have, you know, dozen and a half or so character classes and 15 or so races, all of them with different bonuses. Are they chaotic? Are they neutral? Are they lawful? Do they have this? Are they male? Are they female? How do I balance this out? It can get a little bit overwhelming sometimes if you just want to play a game. But I can see how it would be really useful for replayability. So you play one game where your characters are, you've got big tanks in there and you've got some nice mages and some, some uh, traditional priests for healing. And then maybe the next game session you do, you do more of a thiefly and maybe some uh, courtesans and some lords and some sages, some of the non-traditional character classes. They can do some rather non-traditional things. So I can see for replayability, having it this deep and complex could be a benefit. Also, I, I'm not personally a fan of the aging mechanic. Every race in the game 
has a, a finite lifespan, except elves who live forever. So maybe a kobold lives to be 70 years old or 60 years old. A human might live to 80. And everything you do when you go to a town, you go to rest, whatever, uses up some of your time, anywhere from a month to six months. And sooner or later, your characters get old and they get sick and they die. And you know, when you're on a quest for 120 shards of Uthar, and then according to the game, it takes 120 years to finish the quest, and Lady Bane is still sitting in her castle just fine. It's just, it's a little funny. But that's a personal opinion. When I played Dungeons and Dragons 30 some odd years ago, 35 years ago, we took the whole aging rule thing, dumped it out the window. Oh, a wish spell ages you five years. No, it doesn't, not in our games. Again, personal opinion. I also think maybe the gold reward system could have been tweaked just a little bit. You know, you go in and you fight 15 axe beaks, 12 giants, 16 orcs, and 12 trolls. The whole battle takes you 10 minutes and you barely make it through. You get to the end of the battle, not a single gold piece. No money. Sometimes you get treasure, sometimes you don't. It'd be nice to have more like a, a bard's tale thing where yes, you get experience and you get a certain amount of gold. Oh, and maybe you found a treasure chest that has more gold, but at least you get something at the end of each battle. As you progress further into the game, gold's not an issue. There are ways to get plenty of it. It's just uh, that the whole reward systems would be kind of nice to maybe tweak a little bit. These complaints are so minor Overall, they, they don't affect my scoring at all. But, you know, if you go into a game and you're like, oh, it's perfect, there's no flaws, then you just sound like you're a corporate shill. No, I'm not a corporate shill for double-sided games. They tried to bribe me by sending me two or three million dollars to give them a five-star review. Jeremy, not gonna take it, sorry, buddy. But this is an incredibly deep game. And for those of us who've enjoyed role-playing or, or enjoyed games like The Bard's Tale, enjoyed the Ultima series, this is your cup of tea. And it runs on a VIC-20 absolutely brilliantly. Now don't think for a minute that you need an actual VIC-20 to play it. I've got a couple of them, I love them. I wouldn't play it any other way. But this thing plays perfectly on Vice the emulator that works on PCs and many other platforms. Uh, just tell it, 32K of RAM, D81 file, and you're golden. This thing will play just beautifully. It was also announced this last week that the new upgrade to the C64 Mini console called the C64 is gonna be coming out in December of 2019. And they also surprised a lot of us by saying that it has a VIC-20 mode. They've not gone to into any details about it yet. But if this thing can emulate a VIC-20 and you can tell it, I wanna be a VIC-20 with 32K of RAM, I can't see any reason that this won't run on the new C64 that's coming out in December or on the upgraded 64 Mini. I think it's gonna get a firmware upgrade that's going to allow it to run VIC-20 stuff too. There's a whole new market wide open for people to get interested in the VIC-20 and in this kind of game. It's amazing that after almost 40 years since the VIC-20 came out, people are still making games of this quality and this caliber. Heck, it's just amazing people still love this platform so much. Uh, I encourage all of you fans of the VIC-20 to support the ladies and gentlemen who created this game, who worked so hard on this game to get it out to us. And without one bit of hesitation, this game gets five chicken heads out of five from 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast. But until next time, this is Doug from 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast signing out so I can go find a few more shards of Uthar.